Rob Minen is here from Penn State, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about nitrogen distribution following manure injection. Okay. So thanks very much. I Thank you. Click our changers right up there if you want. All right. Um, quite an honor to be here, uh, sandwiched between two good friends, Joe Harrison and, and Glenn Arnold. So um, good colleagues and uh, talk about manure injection. I'm going to kick that off so changing gears a little bit from what Joe talked about, but Glenn's going to follow this up with manure injection. And I think about uh, injection, and maybe a lot of you are familiar with some of the, uh, you know, I live in, a, in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, so we get a lot of uh, pressure on our farms from the Bay watershed. But Glenn's in western Ohio, and maybe you're familiar with some of the issues out there, and I think injection has a place, and one of the benefits might be getting some of those nutrients below the surface of the soil in the phosphorus world and, uh, you know, helping us break up some macro pores that we heard about yesterday. So I actually brought a nice photo of the uh, watershed that Glenn lives in. <laughs> this is where Glenn lives. Um, <laughs> all right, any questions? Okay. Um, this work that we've done uh, was a couple phases here I want to talk about. Uh, previous work early on with this uh, was dealt with the Pennsylvania PSNT, the pre dress nitrate test. So the PSNT uh, take, typically takes a 12-inch deep core, and uh, it is done around the six-leaf stage of the corn. So it's an early season test that gives us a nitrate reading in the <coughs> soil test and gives an indication of the ability for this nitrogen in the uh, soil currently to cycle and produce enough nitrogen or nitrate to support the rest of the growth that's needed for the crop through the season. Um, if you're in Pennsylvania, if you're under 21 parts per million, you would have a calculation that would tell you how many pounds of nitrogen to put on to supplement that. If you're above 21 parts per million with a nitrate test, then you would uh, be good to go for the rest of the season. For all of our experiments, we use a Let Yetter Avenger at the research farm at Rock Springs, uh, Penn State's uh, research farm. Here's just a side-by-side -side, uh, plot with the uh, injection, six rows of injection versus a uh, side uh, next to it with surface application, both those being about 6,000 gallons per acre. So the thing we did uh, with this first part was we took a monolith sample out and we actually took on uh, from the center marked spot of the where the manure injection band was perpendicular to that band in the direction of travel we took uh, 15 one inch cores 12 inches deep in each direction so a 30 inch monolith sample with a 30 inch spacing between bands so essentially we're trying to cover one band width and center that and get some data on that and look at the PSNT test so this was done at that uh, six leaf stage. And I have a short video here of the monolith sampler. We don't have uh, sound for this, but it's a loud clanging piece of equipment. Dave Otto with NRCS uh, constructed this. That's him running it. It's basically, we're taking a uh, rectangular vessel that's 30 inches long or in width and driving it into the soil. We're pushing it down about 18 inches, but we're only going to take a 12 inch sample from that. So it's a lot of fun to do this. Once it's in the soil, we need a backhoe uh, in these destructive plots to pull that out um, carefully, maneuver it so we get it out. So there's our entertainment on the video end. This is what the, uh, the monolith sampler looks like once we pull it out, excavate it, pull the face off, just take a couple bolts off and pull one of the faces off. You can see the soil there. We're able to carefully mark 12 inches and use a tool to pull off one inch samples. And we take 30 of those across that. And it gives us, not surprisingly, a distribution of nitrate that looks something like this, right? We would expect that type of a sine wave to, uh, to show up. And, you know, you can see maybe from the scale here, 15 inches across with a peak of nitrogen near the, near the band. And this would be about a month after the manure application. So our goal was to look at the soil sampling technique. And others had suggested using a pair. Uh, one 
soil core matched with a pair that would be 15 inches across or half the distance of your spacing. And we wanted to look at this in a manner that would allow a producer to go out in the field as long as he knew the travel direction to be able to take these paired samples and not have to locate the band. So sometimes it's pretty hard when you go out a month later to actually know where the manure and band was unless you carefully mark it. So with this data we were able to take our cores and pair them up at 15 inches and move them around and find out what, uh, you know, what that was. We called that 2.15 inch space sampling. Then we compared that to other sampling protocols and found that this uh, protocol was much better. And this protocol on the bottom was just taking six inch spacing, so five cores across that 30 inches randomly, not knowing where the band was, and taking five of those out as a set, as, a, as opposed to a set of two. Now with this system, we can slide that. If you don't know where the band is, as you do this, you're always going to have one core within three inches of where the manure band is located. So we're going to catch up. We're going to catch those peaks in that sine wave type of idea. As we ran the model for this, when we got the 20 cores, we found that this five point sampling was better. So as we went to, uh, so if you look at the producer, what's he need to do? If we, we send you out to the field, with soil samplers say we need you to take 20 cores, you could take 10 sets of these or four sets of these, and the four sets of five ended up being better. At these 20 point or 20 soil test uh, sets, we ended up with the same average, the same mean at just over 17 parts per million, but with the five point sampling, our standard deviation dropped, and we felt a lot more confident with the, uh, the sampling technique. So the next step was we wanted to look at this a little bit uh, deeper. And what we did, instead of doing all the work to get 30 cores, we carefully marked the band in some new plots and uh, got cores at 3 inches, 6 inches, and 12 inches on each side of the band, and of course one right uh, where the band was marked. We did this for two years with the same shallow disc injection equipment with this 7-point uh, sampling. Um, and we broke these down. Instead of doing a 12 inch composite, we can average these together. We had zero to six inches and six to 12 inches. As we pulled the core out, we broke them up. Kind of give ourselves an idea of what the grid would look like uh, as we move forward. Adding on to this, we also took the same idea of these seven points and two depths. And then we looked at this through five points through the season. So we started with a date one and day two, day three. So we started with that six leaf stage at the PSNT time and moved through to a corn maturity. That makes sense? I haven't presented this graphic before and I thought it was cool enough to make sense. Okay, uh, the sampling dates. Go into this and you think on year two, boy, it'd be great to match the dates, the days in between sampling. But because of dry weather, because of storms and, and wet soil, uh, for various reasons, we weren't quite able to do that. So the days between sampling with our five points, the first time we had 24 days, we matched it perfectly. Then we had some deviation or some separation on those dates as we moved through the season. And you know, the maturity of the corn changes as well. So we had seven points with this data, but one of the things we wanted to look at, look at was to take those three-inch spacings out and just look at the 12, 6, 0, 612 and let, uh, see how that compared on a 12 inch sample to the previous work. And the story was that there's a small data set, but it did confirm and support the previous work on that five point sampling. So a slide here on ammonia. We looked at ammonia and nitrate and nitrogen with this. So on these slides, I have a couple slides here with this type of graph. As we look, at the graph, I put them in the same color, but I used the darker color as the first date. And as the line gets lighter in color, uh, we get further along in the season. And this might be what we expect, right? The uh, parts per million here goes up to 13, and we see a flattening of the curve, right? Early in the season, nitrogen is concentrated a little higher near that manure band, and then starts to flatten out as we move through the season. Again, if you look at this, 
Uh, these were evenly spaced, but keep in mind it's 0, 3, 6, 12, so you know, in a visual world this would kind of be stretched out a little bit more. For, uh, that's for both years for the ammonia. I did connect, I just averaged both years together. The 2015 data was pretty flat, a little drier. The uh, 2016 had more of a curve. But for nitrate, I put both uh, years to get uh, one slide here, 15 and 16. Again, here the darker red is the first sample. As we move through the season, the lighter colors uh, are further through in the date. And you can see a nice, uh, you know, distribution there, and again, that flattening of the curve, a difference in the seasons based on moisture, based on field conditions. And when I combine both of those together, um, you know, you can probably envision what that looks like, but I thought it'd be nice to just show you the average of both years as we combine those together and um, see that distribution. So another thing we wanted to look at and, and did consider was during that uh, PSNT time, as we look at the top six inches of that soil versus the bottom six inches of that, of that uh, sample, was the top six inches predictive of 12 inches? A lot of the PSNT work in our state was done uh, in the 80s and early 90s, and that 12 inch uh, space, that 12 inch depth core came at a time where no-till wasn't as well implemented as it is now. So uh, these fields were no-till fields, and we did find a really uh, nice correlation here or a relationship between the top six inches of soil being able to predict the 12 inches of the average. So when we looked at 12 inch average, the top six inches were very predictive of it. And this is for ammonium, and uh, you can see our R squared there was 87. With nitrate, it even became more impressive as that top six inches gave us an R-square of 98% in predicting the average. So this kind of, in our area, um, might change how we think about that PSNT sampling and maybe make things a little easier for the producer. Instead of trying to get down into 12 inches, he might be able to do six inches. And they might be able to add that six inches. Right? Our normal soil test depth is six inches, so instead of doing a... Uh, separate PSNT test and a separate normal soil test, maybe they can combine these together and get the requirements on their normal soil test with a six inch test. So um, that's what I got as a couple of concluding observations early on and uh, th this newer research does support that five point sampling system taking a total of 20 cores with four sets of five was, was a really good way to predict the average of the soil. Um, the NH4 and NH3 uh, change both of the time and distance from the band, and we see that flattening of the curve through the season. Uh, models that specifically look at the changes were not predictive of that shift in curve. So there's indication there that there's other factors involved, um, weather, soil conditions, field conditions, etc. And uh, one of the things that was really nice to see that top six inches being predictive of the 12 inch average. So with that, um, any discussion or questions? <laughs> I told Glenn I was going to pick on him. He said, boy, you're in trouble because they speak after you. So, so Glenn, you got a couple minutes to, to pick up some ammunition. <laughs> yeah, Joe. So, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Michael. No, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just, this is not, not specifically related to what, what you presented, but did you, have you done any work with the, um, the air loss rates for injection versus surface application for ammonia? Uh, um, there's been a lot of work done with that, right? So we have a lot of work done at Penn State on these same fields with that okay. uh, that confirms a, a good literature depth that injection will greatly decrease the ammonia loss, right? Anytime we can cover up that manure uh, surface area, we are going to see a great reduction in the ammonia loss. So, um, yeah, that, that wasn't part of what we did here, but that's certainly a, a well-established fact in literature. Good, Joe. What was the slope on that ammonia regression? <clears throat> I don't know. Let me go back. This on this? Uh, one six eight. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm looking at the spot. Yeah, thanks. Thanks.
field by chance here? Just... It was not, no. Um, yeah, and you know, the, our Penn State Research Farm is at Rock Springs, and it lives up to its name. You know, whenever you start to get out there with a the, with the soil core, um, there are times where to get a good 12-inch core in these fields, sometimes you've got to go with eight or eight or ten stomps on there, and it, uh, it's sometimes frustrating. So if we can go from 12 to 6 inches, uh, uh, we're much better off. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I didn't catch all of it. Sorry, I'm going between the rooms. What type of soils? And then you did it multiple years. One year you said was drier than another year. So was that dry year and a normal weather pattern year? Was that the years that you included the 0, 6, 6 to 12, and did you notice the So we did, the, we, did the zero to, we did the 0 to 6 and 6 to 12 in both of those years. And then I combined that uh, for the uh, slides here at the end. So the, the, dry, the drier year was the first year, and the second year was more of a, a typical uh, season. And what was the difference between those years? The difference was we didn't see nitrogen cycling as well in year one when the soil was drier. So we didn't see as much uh, uh, soluble nitrogen being produced. So the, uh, through that season, if you look at the ammonium and the nitrate levels, the, the curve stayed much flatter even later through the season. You know, we said that flattening, but they really didn't have uh, much variation even uh, after that second or third uh, sampling like we did with the others. Does that, that make sense? I, would, uh, I guess I was curious if you picked up less nitrates at depth on the dry year than you did on a normal year. Um, you know, I can't say. You know, I think comparing the 6 to 12 inches, we could, I could look at the data, but yeah, I, I think uh, it would be fair to say that we did. Whenever I think of the, the, the uh, grass we have with looking at the 12-inch, they, they too were pretty flat. And what do you mean by, so we have broadcast offset disc incorporation. Is that what you mean, or were they injected and then soil covered with discs? Um, so our injection system was a, a shallow disc uh, system that cut a slot, the manure dropped in behind, and then we had closing wheels behind to, to pinch the soil shut. So it was, it was the uh, manure was closed and covered uh, pretty much immediately. Okay, any other questions? Okay, let's go around the Okay, thank you.